We'll talk to Adrian Wojnarowski, set to join us on loan from ESPN, senior NBA insider, part of ESPN's exclusive NBA draft coverage this uh, Wednesday, starting at 7.30 Eastern. Woj also hosting a new three-part narrative podcast series called The Giannis Draft on the events leading up to the 2013 NBA Draft, available everywhere podcasts are streamed and downloaded. And Woj joining us now. Woj, let me start there. Did mm-hmm. did the Bucks do enough yesterday to keep Giannis long term? I, I don't know, Dan, if that question has been answered yet, but they certainly um, made that team better, and that was uh, a directive from ownership from Giannis. They, they knew they weren't good enough. Uh, they've been a very, very good regular season team. Uh, they have not shown they, they've been built for the playoffs. They. they those are two impactful players in Drew Holiday and Bogdanovich. Uh, I would say this about Giannis. Players come to this crossroad about staying or going, signing or leaving. And generally, in my experience, there are guys who are looking for reasons to leave, and there are guys who are looking for reasons to stay. And I believed all along Giannis has been a player who has been looking for reasons to stay. You look at his life and uh, how – just the – I think the things that are important to him, loyalty is a big part of it and feeling people did right by him. That's a theme throughout his entire life. So I, I, there certainly was a lot of enthusiasm within the Bucks last night into th- this morning. Uh, they're excited, not just that it makes the team better, but that they've given Giannis, given Giannis reasons uh, to want to stay. Uh, I, I think there's a high confidence level that they put themselves in position, but he still has to sign that contract. So this podcast is called the uh, Giannis Draft. It's based on the events leading up to the 2013 NBA Draft. When I go back, I'm still shocked that the Dallas Mavericks didn't end up with Giannis because Donnie Nelson is always so good at finding these players overseas. How did Milwaukee – did Milwaukee just stumble into Giannis? Milwaukee did not stumble into them. They had scouted him extensively. John Hammond, Jeff Waltman, who was their front office at the time – went to see him, they were at 15. The team that had essentially shut down the draft process uh, with his agent, Alex Saratsis, was Atlanta. And they had picks going into the draft. They ended up with 16 and 17. They had brought him in for a visit. They snuck him into Atlanta right before he went to New York for the draft. But Milwaukee was a spot ahead of them. But Dallas is interesting because Donnie Nelson has such a history with international players going back to Dirk and the Lithuanian national team, and obviously driving force and bringing Doncic to Dallas. He loved Giannis. In fact, Mike Procopio, who's in the podcast, was in that room, their draft room that night. He remembers Donnie Nelson comparing Giannis. He reminded him of Dr. J. That was the name he used in the draft room that night. But at the time, Mark Cuban and the organization, they were – determined to get Dwight Howard in free agency. He was the big free agent. They were trying to create more cap space, and by moving down in the draft, they were able to create more space. And they're another team that in in, in the Giannis draft and the story, you know, lives with the regret of, of passing on, you know, a generational player in what was one of the worst drafts in recent history. Remember, Anthony Bennett went number one yeah. in that draft. Oh, boy. Uh, I saw a tweet this morning, and it says that Harden wants the Nets, but Kyrie doesn't want James Harden. Separate fact from fiction here. First of all, is Harden actively trying to get out of Houston, and is Brooklyn the only destination, if that's true? Harden is actively trying to get out of Houston to go to Brooklyn. His focus right now is on one team. That's the Nets. Uh, That's not my reporting, certainly, on the Kyrie piece. Uh, I don't have information that he's not on board with this. I certainly know Kevin Durant is very enthusiastic about it. Uh, The two teams have been in contact, Brooklyn and Houston, but I'm told there hasn't been any real substantive talk um, about a trade. Remember, the Rockets, because Harden has two years left on his deal, they have some time on their side. They don't have to rush into anything yeah. uh, different than the Anthony Davis situation in New Orleans when he was in the final year of his contract when he was able to ultimately push the trade to the Lakers. How does this work in Brooklyn? 
Well, I think the question, there's, there's two questions here. How hellbent is Harden on getting there? Will he, it's easy when you're in the off season, you're not in training camp, you're not playing games to live with this hanging over you. It's different when your players come to work every day. You saw that in Minnesota with Jimmy Butler. Jimmy made it hard for everybody to exist. It couldn't go on forever like that. I don't know that that's how James will approach this. Those are different personalities, different people. But also from Brooklyn, they don't have to have James Harden. And I think Sean Marks' track record as an executive, I don't I, – I think he's always shown great restraint in doing deals – the idea of a, you know, the kind of deal the previous regime did for, with the Celtics with multiple picks and multiple pick swaps going out into infinity almost, uh, that's not his style. I think there, there is the potential for a restrained offer for Harden, but I don't imagine that the Nets are going to go at it, would go at it with desperation. They don't have to have them, but having them, and the three of them, it's something you've got to look at. And I do think they're going to look at it and are looking at it. But there's a big difference between that and getting to a place where you have a deal. Yeah, I, if I'm the Rockets, I'm in no hurry right now. I don't know. What are they doing with Russell Westbrook? Well, they're more active in trying to seek out trades with Westbrook. Uh, they're different players, and there's different values on them around the league right now. Um you know, Westbrook right now, I'm not aware of any traction anywhere on a possible deal. I think it's very likely that both Westbrook and Harden are back, uh, are still on the roster, certainly, for the start of training camp in early December. We're talking to Adrian Wojnarowski, ESPN Senior NBA Insider, part of the draft coming up, also has a new three-part narrative podcast series called The Giannis Draft the events leading up to the 2013 NBA draft. Give me what the Lakers are doing right now. Well, they're certainly uh, excited. They were able to land Dennis Schroeder in a deal. They're waiting to see what happens with Rajon Rondo. I think there's a market for him where he can make more money potentially in free agency than is available for him um, with the Lakers. And, you know, Contavious Caldwell Pope is going to be an interesting one. Uh, They'll want to keep him. I think he's looking for a payday with them. And I think with Anthony Davis, it is just a matter of how long of an extension or a new deal is he going to do with the Lakers? Does he get on the same contract time frame in a, in a, in a short deal with LeBron, or does he go and extend uh, longer than that? But, but obviously, Davis will be back with L.A. Chris Paul deal. Um, you know, I, I know he wins. I know he's at a stage in his career of – Milwaukee, I always felt was going to be a better landing spot. I thought, you know, to win a championship maybe, but Phoenix almost felt like a lifestyle uh, situation as well. Give me the logic with Phoenix bringing in Chris Paul. This is an organization that needs credibility. They've needed leadership. I think they, they really answered, they really started to fill that leadership credibility void by hiring Monty Williams last year. You saw the impact Williams had. On that team, that's an organization. I think we've lost Woj. That's probably that uh, is an organization. Yes, it is technically right. Maybe he's getting another call. Ooh, very possible. Mm-hmm. Yes, McLovin. Maybe it's a Brooklyn area code came in. He just had to <laughs> drop it immediately. Wouldn't it be great if he didn't even say hold on? He just goes boop. And well, just... remember when we had Brian Cashman on the Yankees GM? And I said, what if George Steinbrenner calls? He goes, oh, I hang up on you. Like, there was not even any – I don't even know if he says goodbye. I just think it's basically, oh, I'm, I, I'm so take that other call there. But uh, Fritzy working on getting uh, Woj back there. Yeah, the Chris Paul situation. You know, Phoenix probably looked at what they did in the bubble where they went 8-0 and went, you know, we, we can compete with all of these teams. And then you bring in Chris Paul. All right. I mean – he wins, but you know, what is he, 34, 35? Woj, you were just, just on the, uh, the precipice of telling something really important yeah, about Phoenix. I tried to send the other call to voicemail, and I hung you up. Dan. I apologize. <laughs> that wasn't a Brooklyn. I, I, I should know how to work a phone by now. <laughs> that wasn't a Brooklyn area code calling, right? No, that was okay. a Midwestern. I'll leave it at that. Midwestern. Okay. okay, yeah, we don't take those phone calls. Nobody wants to hear <laughs> from Indiana. Um, so 
Chris Paul, they think this is legitimate here with what they can do, you know, you yeah, know, the, right like, away. this is an organization. Yeah, they need to get in the playoffs. They have been so bad for so long and rudderless. And to have someone like Chris Paul for Devin Booker, for DeAndre Ayton, those are players who have been a part of a lot of dysfunction there previous to Monty Williams' arrival and losing and bad habits that come from that. Chris Paul brings just a competitive spirit, a leadership, and listen, he's still playing at a very high level at 35 years old. Given that he's got a couple years left on the deal, the fact that Robert Sarver is going to pay that contract, I think it's a no-brainer. I think it's unique to Phoenix. That's just, they need to get into playoffs. They need to show that they're a real NBA organization again. It's a great NBA market. It's got great history in Phoenix, a great fan base, and they deserve better than what they've had for a very long time under Sarver. I think this, for them, was a step they absolutely had to make. I thought it was a great deal for them. I must be in the minority here, but I am sounding the bugle of what about Golden State as a title contender? And it just feels like when we talk about the West, Golden State doesn't is not in the picture. What am I missing here, Woj? Well, I, I think just the fact that they were out of sight and out of mind for a year, and Durant left, and but you come back and Steph Curry and Clay Thompson and certainly Draymond and uh, Andrew Wiggins, who you kind of forget uh, was traded there just prior to the season shutting down, and they're going to have a chance at the top of the draft here uh, to get. Uh, you know, one of the elite players in this draft, and that's going to be somebody either they're going to keep and try to develop, or maybe if they don't use that player in a trade on draft night, later on that big player starts banging the drum to get out of somewhere, and that pick the Warriors make ends up in a larger deal down the road. But, uh, yeah, listen, this Warrior team is still going to be very formidable in the West. Like that, they're, they're not going away. Do you have an idea of who that name who would want to get out of a place to end up at Golden State is, Woj? No, but listen, I think the whole league is going to wait and see what happens with Bradley Beal. He has made it very clear. He is, uh, want, right now he is in Washington, uh, that he is committed to staying there. He signed a short deal last year, but they've got to continue to improve in Washington. They've got to show him that there's a pathway to being uh, a contender in the East again. But Beal is the one everyone's watching. I give Tommy Shepard and Ted Leonsis a lot of credit in Washington. A year ago, uh, when when uh, Shepard took over, you would have thought Beal was on the way out. And he has shown him um, a lot of promise with trying to piece together uh, that organization again. And so Beal has been very loyal. Uh, he wants it to work in Washington uh, so right now he's not available. He has told them, I'm, I want to, I want to be here now, but that's still going to be addressed over the long term. Every team in the league uh, would love for Bradley Beal to be out on the trade market, but, but that's not the case now. What's the wildest rumor you've heard in the last week or so? Oh, none, Kai, uh, none come to mind. I, none, none that are, I think what is going to be really interesting, Dan, though, is the financial impact of this pandemic and the loss of revenue around the league. How many teams out there, how many owners are really going to be willing to spend and, and really push it financially here in the short term? You know, we talked about last season being the asterisk season. Yeah. I wonder about this year with the pandemic and the potential of, of – the virus costing teams games, just like happens in baseball or players being out. We took for granted in the bubble, everyone was going to stay healthy. Um, how many teams actually play 72 regular season games this year? How many key players are missing in those? And you're playing without fans and all those things. This is the year more than that bubble championship where things could get a little out of whack. And as teams are again putting together their payrolls and teams, there are a lot of teams suffering financially in this who you just may see be less than competitive, less than aggressive uh, in free agency and around the draft. Owners like Steve Ballmer, the Lakers make a lot of money with that local TV deal. That doesn't go away with no fans in the arena. How does it impact all these teams as they put rosters together and, and try to win this title? Woj, good luck with the podcast and, uh, of course, the NBA draft tomorrow night. We appreciate your time as always. 
Thanks for having me as always, Dan. Good to be with you. uh, Adrian Wojnarowski, ESPN Senior NBA Insider, part of the draft coverage. Wednesday night, it starts at 7.30 Eastern on the Mothership and the uh, podcast called The Giannis Draft, the events leading up to the 2013 NBA Draft, available everywhere podcasts are streamed and downloaded.